Okay, we are now recording. Thank you, Liana. Hi, everyone. I'm Philip. I'm the chair of the Wikipedia and Education User Group, and welcome to our um, first summer <laughs> online uh, Zoom meeting. Um, and it's a public meeting that is organized by this user group. Um, so the, the agenda for today is as follows. We're going to do a round of introductions pretty quickly. And then um, Liana is going to uh, give a re retrospect about what has been going on within the user group in the past few months bef um, between this and the past meeting. And, uh, and then we have two featured speakers who have kindly agreed to join us today and, and um, showcase uh, their product, basically, something that's very useful to um, our community and something that uh, all of us can, can learn from. So uh, Sage Ross presenting the uh, at, at dashboard and Magnus Manske um, presenting um, PetScan. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's start uh, with the introductions. And first, um, I'm going to go with order that, it's on, that is on my screen. So Joao, do you want to start first? Okay. Sure. And the thing, Philip, I'm trying to bring four Brazilians into the Zoom meeting, and they are unable to access it. So I'm, I'm Joelle, let me let me paste a link for you in the chat. I sent the wrong email or a uh, wrong link around by email. Sorry. Okay, my, my bad. Sorry, Philip. Because I'm I'm in two meetings because people are I are pinging me. Okay, so I can't join. And I'm trying to figure out. Só um segundo, pessoal, que eu tô resolvendo aqui para passar o link para vocês. I just pasted a link there into the chat. You should be able to use that one to invite people to join. Okay, thank you, Philip. I think you can start the other way around and I can introduce myself just so I can troubleshoot this. Sure. Sage? I'm Sage Ross. Um, I've been working for Wiki Education for the last many years and uh, my work focuses on building our technical tools for our education program. Um, and so I've been maintaining uh, the, the dashboard for the last several years. Cool. Susanna? Hi, everyone. I am Susanna, Susanna uh, from Armenia. Uh, I am the uh, chair of the Wikimedia Armenia. Uh, also, I am in the board of uh, uh, Wiki Education User Group. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Josefina? Hi, I'm Josephine from uh, Wikimedia Sverige, Wikimedia Sweden, uh, where I work as a project leader for education and uh, learning and things con yeah, concerning that. Great. Edna? Hi, everyone. I'm going to turn my video off. Um, I'm the Partnerships Consultant for Latin America. Um, and of course, I love all things education and technology. So thank you so much for taking this space to, to explain to us and, and keep on learning. So thank you. Thanks for being here. OK, Magnus? Uh, hi, I'm Magnus. Uh, I. Uh, uh, develop and maintain the odd tool around uh, 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 Wikipedia and Wikidata. Uh, I'm uh, actually a, a biologist. Uh, in my day job, I do this just uh, uh, on the side. Great, thanks. Lucy? Uh, hi, I'm Lucy. I come from Czech Republic and I'm the Wikimedia Education Manager for the Czech Wikimedia. Great. Liana? Hi, everyone. I am Liana. I also am part of Wiki Education and have been a longtime colleague of SAGES. Um, and I oversee our programmatic work um, in my day job. On the other side of um, things, I also am on the board of the Wikipedia and Education User Group. Thank you. Nirzal? 
Hello everybody. My name is Nirjal Shrest and I'm from Nepal. And I'm the member of the Wikimedia of Nepal and engaged in Wikimedia education program in Nepal since eight years. And I'm, I'm also doing teaching uh, for undergraduate students in Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Giovanna? Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, well, I'm Giovanna. I'm from Brazil. I am the project manager for the Week Movement Brazil user group, uh, together with Zhuang, who is here. And in this position, I take care of uh, partnerships with land institutions and uh, now with the uh, educational aspect as well. So the educational programs of the Brazilian community as well. Thank you. Arif. Hi, Arif, are you here? Oh, I, I think he hasn't joined yet. So with the audio, so let's go to Erika. Erika Azalini, are you here? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I was having some internet trouble, but I think I figured it out. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm part of the Wiki Movement Brazil as well, and I'm in charge of our communication. Thank you. Um, Sturm, are you here? Uh, yes, I, I can hear you. Yes. Do you want to introduce yourself? Just a sentence or two? Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> I'm a longtime Brazilian editor and uh, administrator on Wiko to Wikipedia, in, both in Portuguese. I'm a founding member of the uh, Wiki Movement Brazil, the sole uh, user group in Brazil nowadays. And that's it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, circling back to Joao. Sorry? Okay, thanks. Oh, thanks, Philip. So, uh, thanks, Liana, also for the link. So, I'm Joao. I'm very happy to be here. I'm a member of the Wikipedia Education User Group Board and also the current chair of Wikimovimento Brasil. So, it's a pleasure to bring the two affiliates together for this wonderful meeting. Thank you. And we have Arif and Eder who are not, who have not joined with audio, so we can't hear them, but I'm just acknowledging that they're here. Um, and that's it for, for introductions. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time from uh, the featured speakers, so um, I, I'm going to give the mic to Liana, who's going to give a brief overview of the uh, of what's been going on in the user group in the past few months. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, so uh, first off, I just wanted to acknowledge we had been planning um, a Wikipedia and education conference for this fall um, in Philip's town of Belgrade, Serbia. Unfortunately, given the COVID-19 situation and the Wikimedia Foundation's um, smart decision to postpone all of um, in-person events for the remainder of the year, given the health situation globally, we will not be having that conference um, this year. That being said, the user group is still very committed to having that whenever we are able to meet in person again. So um, sort of stay tuned for that. And when something changes with the sort of global health situation, then um, we are eager to bring everyone together again and um, get going on those plans. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, the second thing I have as an update is, I think actually most of the people on the call here have already sent me this, but um, for the for the recording, um, I will I will also speak about this in case there's folks um, who will watch it afterwards who um, have not participated yet. But one of the other uh, initiatives that the user group is doing right now is a data collection initiative, and so one of the things that we are trying to do is be able to get a sense of 
what percentage of all of the new active editors globally across the Wikimedia projects are coming from the education programs uh, worldwide. And so in order to find out that information, um, I think it's probably a fairly high percentage. Uh, the, the work that we all do to bring new editors to the projects and engage them is incredible. And I think this, if we bring all of our numbers together, I think it will be a really valuable way for us to show the impact that our program has across all language versions of all projects. So um, if you are able to, what I would appreciate doing, and I sent an email around to the education list and I will send a follow-up email later this week um, remind, with, with reminders as well, um, is to send me all of the usernames of uh, participants in your education program that you have brought to Wikipedia in the last um, academic year. So that would be sort of June 2018 to June uh, 2019. Uh, or I'm sorry, June 2019 to June 2020. I just moved back a year there. Um, so, so this will allow us to do that calculation to figure out what that percentage is. And a number of folks have already shared their usernames with me, and I really appreciate that. If you haven't done that, please do it soon. Um, and I will send an email around to the list about that as well. Um, and then finally, you may have seen we did a tech needs survey. Um, Krishna ran that for us. Unfortunately, he's not able to join this meeting right now, but um, he ran a tech needs survey for us to our community earlier this year. And we've gotten the results from that study um, or that survey. And what we've essentially found is that there's not one sort of glaring thing that everyone has been looking for. And there's a lot of sort of little things that would make people's lives a lot easier. And so um, we're gonna spend some time as a user group sort of looking through those and seeing if we can figure out something. But one of the sort of most obvious things that came out of that survey was that people perhaps just needed more education about how to use um, some of the tools that already exist. And so um, we realized as a user group, this would be a good opportunity to bring forth a one of our open meetings focused specifically more on sort of how to around tools. And so I'm particularly excited for these two featured speakers because one of the things that the survey revealed is that um, PetScan and the Program and Events Dashboard were the two tools that were used most by education program leaders. And so, um, with that, I think this is a good transition into um, our featured speakers for today, but I will pause here in case there are any questions about the user group's activities right now that Philip or I or Susanna or Joao could answer. I'm good. Thank you, Liana. Okay. Hearing no questions, Philip, should I turn it back over to you to turn it over to a speaker? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks, Liana, for this great overview. Um, so yeah, if there are no questions, we can uh, start with the first speaker. Uh, I'd like to give uh, the mic to Magnus, uh, who's, uh, let's say, uh, elder of the two and um, has been more prolific in terms of smaller tools. And we're very grateful as a community, I think, uh, to Magnus for all his work uh, towards building great tools that are useful and, and um, uh, you know, provide a, a variety of coverage for, for all the needs that our community needs. So, has. so, um, so yeah, um, Magnus, uh, now's your time. Please present Petcan. Okay, uh, so I'll start with sharing my screen. I hope you can all see this. Uh, in a moment, except it doesn't work. Uh, desktop share, yes. Uh, and I need to. Uh, I need to reconnect uh, because uh, system settings. Not a problem.
Uh, can you hear me again? Yes. yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Not right no. now. No. No. Okay. Let's try this again. Um, yes, we can. Now we see it. Yes. Okay. So if you haven't seen PET scan, that might be a, a lot to show. So I'll go through the basic options uh, uh, first, and then I'll show some examples. So PET scan is a tool that lets you uh, query um, uh, the various media, uh, wiki-based sites, so Wikipedias, but also Wiktionary, uh, Wikibooks, Wikisource, and especially Wikidata. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, it always returns a list of uh, pages, articles, or Wikidata items. So one simple thing is to uh, uh, go to Wikipedia and uh, query um, for categories. So basically, it can show you um, all articles in a category. It can show you articles in a category tree to a certain depth, uh, so including subcategories. It can uh, show you uh, articles that are interse in intersections of two or more category trees. It can exclude some categories. It can uh, filter by uh, various page properties, including namespace, size, age, last edits, uh, ORIS, if you know about that. Um, uh, it can uh, filter by uh, uh, templates, by uh, links from in two pages. Uh, for templates, it can also filter by uh, uh, the presence on talk pages because many pages are maintained uh, for the wiki projects by other talk pages. And you can combine this with other uh, uh, sources, not just the Wikipedia um, categories and templates. You can use Sparkle, you can have manual list of articles or items. Uh, you can use uh, page pile IDs, which is one of my other tools. Uh, you can use uh, the plain text search as a uh, source uh, and you can combine these sources so you can say everything that's in the category query but not uh, in the Sparkle query. By default, they're all uh, combined with end like they uh, do in a search engine. Uh, you can also use uh, specific queries for wiki data. Uh, 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 things that have uh, uh, site links, labels to specific, uh, uh, with specific languages, um, links to certain items, and so on. And you have various output options, uh, various formats here. Um, uh, you can get additional info for files. You can get uh, metadata for the pages. And you can, uh, uh, instead of the pages, show uh, the red links, which is the uh, links uh, to, to non-existing pages, uh, uh, basically sorted uh, by which ones are more popular in your uh, uh, query set. So I know that was a lot, so I'll start with an example. This just shows all the articles on English Wikipedia uh, in the category biologists, which is basically what you would see when you go to the uh, a category biology page on Wikipedia. And of course it takes a long time now. So there's uh, three articles in there, uh, which is uh, very boring, but then you can say, okay, I want everything in biologists and the first subcategories. So now you get 300 something results. And if you go, uh, 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 to the subcategories. Of the subcategories, um, you get how many? 5,000 something. Uh, if you go uh, into even more depths, you'll get uh, more. Um, uh, but this is just one single category. So uh, what you can also do is have a category intersection. So I want all articles on English Wikipedia that are both in uh, this category, burials at Westminster Abbey, and that are circumnavigators of the globe. Um, and that is exactly one, which is Charles Darwin. 
Um, we can do this more complicated. So this will get Charles Darwin as well. That is the birth and death year uh, to category to depth zero, but also in biologists to depth two, because uh, uh, it's uh, uh, Charles Darwin is not directly in category biologist, but in some sub subcategory. Uh, so you can combine this uh, as much as you want, as many interactions, uh, intersections as you want. You can also do unions on uh, multiple category trees. Um, we can also say we want all biologists to depth two. Um, and that um, have this um, uh, Sparkle query on Wikidata as a result. And again, so this is, I don't actually remember what this is, but again, it returns Charles Darwin as its only result. In this uh, case, it returns the Wikidata item because the tool knows, oh, we have results from English Wikipedia and we have results from Wikidata. And these are um, most easily combined on Wikidata itself. So it falls back to um, uh, Wikidata. Uh, you can change that and say, oh, I want English Wikipedia instead, or I want French Wikipedia instead. Um, uh, you can also uh, um, uh, use other tools based on uh, PET scan. So one example here is this is a Sparkle query that gives you all uh, Indian authors, Indian writers on Wikidata. This is uh, uh, 6,000 something here. Um, but then uh, what you can do is, uh, uh, let's say you know uh, something about these results uh, that you want to change on Wikidata. You want to add a statement on Wikidata. You can add your um, statement here in a compressed form and start quick statements, which is another one of my tools, which can uh, then add or remove these statements to all these articles that you have selected. So you can uh, change these, of course, before you start the tool. I'm not demonstrating this. I don't want to change anything on Wikidata right now. Uh, another tool you can use is um, uh, find images uh, uh, for Wikidata uh, from the associated Wikipedia articles. I've run this already here because it takes a few seconds to load. And as you can see, uh, this already has found some uh, pictures on Wikipedia. Uh, uh, the pictures themselves are stored on comments. And I could just click this and it would add this image to this uh, Wikidata item about this writer. Uh, there are several other tools that, you, that use PetScan as a source. So um, um, uh, uh, you can use it. Uh, you can use PetScan directly or as a basis for uh, uh, further uh, actions or queries if you want. And that's pretty much my demo. And uh, um, uh, uh, please ask some questions if you like. And I'm trying to get back to the <laughs> video here. Um, ah, here. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, do we have any questions right now? Yeah, so let, I can ask a question. Hi, Magnus e Joao. Nice to see yeah. you again. Um, so I've been using PetScan for uh, generating lists for my students to work on, and then I publish them on Wikipedia. But then every time that I need to update them, it needs, as far as I understand, to be done manually. So it's differently from, for instance, what would be Listeria that is, uh, that can be uh, updated to a bot. Is, am I doing this wrong? Or uh, basically, is there a way to automatically update lists that I feed to Wikipedia uh, through PetScan. 
Uh, there is not so pets can just just generate the list uh, based on the data as it is right now. Uh, there is no automated uh, update there. Uh, I was thinking of uh, actually using uh, PetScan as a source for Listeria, uh, uh, but uh, that might lead to uh, overloading uh, PetScan because I know there's uh, um, tens of thousands of Listeria lists out there. And if many of them uh, use PetScan as a source, these would all bombard uh, PetScan automatically uh, once a day at least. Uh, uh, for an update, uh, so that's uh, that's a bit problematic. That's why I haven't implemented that. Um, I think the easiest way is uh, so every time you run a PET scan query, you get this PSID number, uh, which is a link. Um, uh, if instead of uh, 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 or in addition to uh, putting the list on Wikipedia. Uh, add the link to this uh, 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 PET scan ID. Uh, let me uh, just show this where it is here. Uh, so here is this this PSID on every result page. Um, and uh, if you uh, click on that, or if you use this URL, this exact same query that you have run will be uh, recreated. Uh, and you will see the, the current state of it. It will not update uh, Wikipedia though. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Do we have any other questions? Well, if not, <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Magnus again for this presentation. Um, again, uh, Magnus, do you have any uh, contact info that if people want to uh, ask you about this, they can reach you somehow? Or uh, yes, yes. Um, uh, 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 best would be my my Wikidata uh, user page. Great. Can you give us a link here? Uh, where I can try to find it. Huh. Uh, one moment. Yeah, I'm going to paste it now if I can find the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There. Yeah, so if you're listening to this and you have any questions about this, you can ask Magnus on his talk page on Wikidata. Um, and that's it, thank you. Um, thank you. I, uh, and uh, if someone else um, thinks of another question, uh, we can leave it for after Sage's presentation. So Sage, now it's your turn. Thank you. Um, so I will do a little demo of Programs and Events Dashboard. Um, and I'm starting with the assumption that you all know the, the basics of, of what you can do with it, tracking the activity of a group of users. Um, and so I'll just walk through setting up um, an event and uh, showing off some of the different things that you can do with it. Um, my screen sharing's working? Yes. Yes. Great. So when you want to create an event, um, you can just log in with your Wikipedia account, and there will be a Create an Independent Program button. Um, and this will launch the course creator. And so you'll go to Create a New Program, and you can choose from three types depending on what type of thing you're doing. So if it's an education program, typically you'll want to use either a basic program or an article scoped program. And I'll go into detail about what the other things are besides a basic program um, in a little bit. But you'll put in your title, um, and this would be something like my new course and the institution that it's part of, um, my test 
tool. And then you can enter uh, what the home wiki is, what wiki it's mainly based on, as well as any other wikis that you also want to track activity on. So let's say I want to track activity on Wikidata and also on Spanish Wikipedia. Um, and then you can put in a description. And then you set the dates um, when this program is happening, when you want to track activity from all the users. So we'll start it from today and it'll go through um, you know, the next week. Um, and you can optionally add um, additional times to kind of specify for in-person events when the actual events are taking place. This is useful for edit-a-thons where you want to track both things that happen after the edit-a-thon ends or maybe before it begins, but you also want to have a clear indication for participants of exactly when they should show up in person to an event. Um, and then you can do create my program and now you have a live program up and running. So once you have this, um, you'll have a link up at the top that you can distribute to people that they can use to join this program. Uh, and so with that link, that's all they'll need to add themselves. Or um, you can, uh, if you know who's participating, you can add and remove users yourself. Um, so you can add in one user, I'll add in myself. Um, or if you have a whole list of users for something that happened in the past, you had an in-person edit-a-thon and you want to, um, and you recorded all the usernames at that point, and now you want to keep track of what they did during the event, you can also paste that in um, and add multiple users at once. Um, one of the other things that you can do on a course like this is you can enable account requests. So this uh, is useful for, for in-person events and anything where some of the people that you're working with um, may run into the IP limit for creating new accounts. So if you have an edit-a-thon and you want to make sure that people can create accounts um, and there'll be more than however many the number is right now, I think four, um, then you can enable account creation. And this will do two things. Um, if you provide the link to people, um, they will have the option to put in the account name that they want to create and then the dashboard can um, create that for them so that it works around the IP limit. Um, or you as the program organizer um, can um, create accounts for people right now. So you can check whether a given username is, is available. Um, let's try Rage Sauce. Um, So I'm going to check whether that's available. Oh, that's already taken, so I have to choose something else. So Rage Sauce 101, and I'm going to check that for availability. So that one is available, and I could create an account right now and have the password sent to the email address that I put in. So this is useful if you're running an in-person event and you want to have someone in charge of making sure everyone gets accounts very quickly. So they can go to this person, uh, and that person, one of the organizers, can create their accounts immediately and give them access to them. And they'll automatically also be added to the event at the same time so that any event, uh, any edits that they make will be tracked as part of this event. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to um, a, an event that I already set up um, that already has some data. So while an event is happening, it will periodically, usually every couple of hours, uh, get updated data with the latest edits that anyone has made as part of it. Um, and you can go to the articles tab and see for all of the tracked wikis, which are main space articles participants have edited. Um, one of the things that you can do as an organizer is you can say, hey, this one person was editing things that had nothing to do with my event. So I don't actually want to count those edits as part of it so you can in this tracked column, untrack one of one of the articles that was edited. And then the next time the stats are updated, um, those edits will be excluded and only the other articles that are still tracked uh, will be the ones that, that uh, count towards the statistics. Um, 
another thing that you can do is you, if you only care about edits in a very particular um, set of articles, for example, a PET scan query or a certain category on Wikipedia, you, you have a thematic event that's taking place over a long period, but people are doing other things as well and you only want to track um, certain articles. Um, another option is to use that article scope program option that I, that I mentioned earlier. And so that's something after an event is created, you can also change the type. So you change it from type generic to type article scope program. And when you make this change, um, one of the things that will happen is that the next time the statistics update, um, which I'll just make happen right now um, for demonstration purposes, um, then the only things that will be counted are articles that are part of uh, whichever specific articles you wanted to track or whichever categories you wanted to track. Um, so this will just take a few more seconds to update and then I'll be able to show you what you can do with that. Um, so now that this is an article scope program, instead of showing the five different articles that we saw earlier, now the only one that's showing up is one that matches one of these um, tracked categories that I've added. So there are different options for doing this. You can add a template. So for example, if you wanted to track all of the articles that have the wiki project history template on the talk page, um, then you can do that by adding the template and pasting in the template name. Um, if you wanted to track a category, um, category wiki project summer set, for example, which is um, part of what the cheddar cheese articles in, um, you do that. This, um, you can do that with category. Um, so you put in category and then and put in whatever category um, you need, and that can work for a talk page category or a main space category, um, or you can use a PET scan ID. So if you get that PET scan ID that, that Magnus showed off um, and paste that in, for example, uh, this PET scan query that I put in earlier, uh, which is indeed uh, Somerset Cuisine and includes seven articles, including the cheddar cheese article, um, then, then that will allow you to, to track based on that as well. And then you can also use PagePile, which is um, a related tool um, that unlike PET scan, where um, it's a query that you can rerun over and over to get the latest uh, group of things. Um, a page pile creates a static set of pages that you can refer back to. So if you want an unchanging collection of pages to refer to um, and, and track over time, then page pile is, is a, a good option for that. Um, so those are all things that you can use to scope the set of articles. And then you can also individually add assigned articles, uh, which will also be tracked in terms of any edits made to those articles. Um, a couple of the advanced features that are useful for some people um, are what I'll move into now. Um, so one of them is on wiki course pages. So individual wikis um, can be configured uh, with approval of the community so that the dashboard will create a copy of um, a course page on that wiki so that users on that wiki can easily see who are all the students who were part of this program. So um, check Wikipedia has this enabled. And so uh, course pages where the home wiki is check Wikipedia, um, the title of it actually is a link to Wikipedia. And on that Wikipedia page, you get all of the information, including the list of all the enrolled users, which automatically gets updated by the dashboard any time um, a new user joins. So if we looked at the edit history of this page on Wikipedia, uh, these are all automatic edits um, that happened via the dashboard using the account of whoever made that change on the dashboard. So in this case, uh, Voita uh, has both created the course and added all of the students to it. And so you see his account via the dashboard making all these updates. Um, and it will also do things like um, 
automatically add um, a template to um, a user page uh, when when that user um, joins the course so that it makes it easy for the community to keep track of oh, these are new users who are part of a course now I know the context now I know who to reach out to if these students are um, doing bad work and need some correction. Um, one of the other things um, that you can enable for an individual course um, in, in the, the settings, you can say timeline enabled. And if you set it to timeline enabled, um, you get an additional tab that you don't normally get, the timeline tab. And this allows you to create on the dashboard uh, a custom day by day, week by week plan for what will actually be happening as part of this program. So this is useful for education programs where basically the instructor can put the syllabus, um, you know, section by section of how the, the project will progress um, onto the dashboard. Um, and one of the things that you can do if you're using a timeline is you can also assign training modules. So if you create, um, create some timeline content, um, you can choose from any of the training modules that the dashboard has available. Um, and if you do that, this training module will now be assigned as part of the course and students who are enrolled, if they visit the dashboard, will see, oh, I have this training module assigned and I need to do it. And so they'll get a link to the training module where they can go through and, you know, learn about Wikipedia, learn what's in the training modules. Um, some of these training modules are um, available in multiple languages, and some of them are custom content specific to uh, one version of Wikipedia, one, one project. So there are some German Wikipedia training modules, for example, that are only available in German. Um, one of the other things that can be pretty useful, um, and if anybody is interested in creating um, custom training modules, that's possible as well. The, the content actually all lives on Meta. So um, if, if people want to learn more about that, I can show that off um, towards the end, but I'll, I'll skip over it for now unless there's, um, unless that's something that people want to dive into. Um, one of the other useful features that you can do for an entire campaign, um, which in this case, uh, this is the art and feminism campaign. Um, so this collects all of the different programs that are individual art plus feminism edit-a-thons. Um, and this is the, just the, the campaign page and the alerts tab for this um, collects up all of the different um, things that the dashboard has detected that you as a program organizer might be interested to look into more. So in this case, by default, it's showing articles for deletion alerts and discretionary sanctions alerts. So that means these are all of the articles on English Wikipedia that are under discretionary sanctions, um, that it's kind of a danger zone for new editors to work on, um, just because they may, they may end up either getting blocked or being reverted rather quickly because these are hot topics that um, have special restrictions on them. Or um, if an article has been nominated for deletion, it was worked on one, by one of the participants, um, you can see that as well. So um, we can see some articles here that were edited a couple of days ago, um, some of which are currently uh, in danger of deletion, some of which, like I think this one, no, this one is, I think this one was uh, proposed for deletion, but then um, that was removed. Whereas this one, I think this one also, um, a couple of these were already, have already been deleted, uh, this one, for example. Um, so that can be useful, especially during edit-a-thons, um, to quickly get some expert attention on, on articles from newcomers that are in danger of deletion. Um, so if they can be saved, then they can add more sources and, and make sure that they stick around. Or if they're um, an acceptable work, um, you, can, you can pinpoint which uh, participant in your event um, did that and at least you know, let them down easy about, about why their article needed to be deleted. Um, a couple of other things that can be pretty useful. Um, on your course page, uh, you can, from the home tab, 
once it's over, uh, download stats. So there are a whole bunch of different stats, including the list of editors with a summary of how much each person contributed, a list of all of the um, files they uploaded to Commons, a list of every revision they, they made uh, during the event. Um, you can download in CSV format um, any of these things. Um, so that can be useful afterwards for doing analytics. Um, and that is all that I really wanted to show off. Um, questions? Thank you. I, I have one question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for a very knowledgeable presentation. And uh, one thing I want to ask, uh, if we are going to uh, conduct series of uh, courses under one single theme, can we track that in this uh, dashboard? Um, yes. So I'll share my screen again and show off some of the basics of how that works. Um, so one of the core concepts of the dashboard is a campaign. Um, and a campaign is basically a set of individual events. Um, so for example, there's a campaign for Art Plus Feminism 2016, which is used to track all of the different um, individual edit-a-thons that happened uh, for that. Or we can um, probably find something more education related um, the, uh, the Studenti program for Czech Wikipedia, for example. So this collects all of the individual programs um, and um, if you want to create a new one of these, then when you find the campaigns page, you can create a new campaign. So you just give it a name and then whenever you create um, a new program, you can, for example, start from that page when you do create a new program instead of from the um, from the home page, and that will automatically create it as part of this campaign. Or once you've created a program, um, here's here's the the new one that I created, for example. Um, you can remove the 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 default campaign and add in your own campaign. Um, so you've already created a campaign. Say it was um, Brazilian Wikimedia Education Program, and when you add that. Uh, add that campaign to your to your event, um, then it will be part of it. And so once you've done that, then you have a campaign page that collects up the cumulative statistics across all of the events that are part of that campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also have a question. Uh, I don't know if it's a kind of silly question, maybe. Uh, and I don't know if you said that during the presentation and I just didn't hear, but uh, most of the things that you showed, uh, they were, uh, I don't know, configurations that could only be accessed if you are an admin on the Outlook dashboard or not? Um, great question. No, everything that I showed, um, you can, you don't need to be an admin to do. You can create a new program, you can create your own campaign uh, and add your program to that campaign. Um, you can view the, um, the alerts for, for your campaign. Um, you can, if you are the creator of the campaign, if you're one of the organizers of the campaign, um, then you can create accounts for other people through the dashboard and you can change the program type and add categories, all of those things um, anyone can do for a program they're organizing. But uh, the most spe specific things that you showed, for example, the uh, the part that you tracked only a, uh, a template, for example, or some of these stats as well, I can access that through my account because I'm not a admin. At least if I, like I, I'm trying here, uh, I tried last night. I tried some other times. And I couldn't access that, so that's why. I, and um, I don't know why exactly. What, was it was it for a program that you are the organizer of? Uh, some of them, yes. Others, not. Yeah. 
So if, if you are listed as, um, like, if you're listed as the facilitator um, for a given program, then you should be able to do all of the things that I just showed. Okay. And if, okay. um, so whoever created it will be the first facilitator of it, and you can add mm -hmm. additional users. Um, but as long as you're the facilitator, um, everything that I showed should be accessible to you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see Josephine's um, uh, hand up. Um, so. Uh, ah, yeah. I, I have a question about the timeline function because yeah. when I try to set a scope of uh, weeks, um, I uh, could only edit the last week. I set a, a time period and then it automatically made up um, a week schedule from mm -hmm. that. Uh, but the only thing I can change is always only the last week of that scope. Is that a bug or? Um, so it probably looks something like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's kind of a bug uh, in that um, the timeline feature is mainly, um, was mainly initially designed around um, Wiki education programs where we have as part of the setup process, um, some additional configuration that you do. And in particular, um, what you do is you select the days of the week on which the class meets. So mm -hmm. I'll show you an example here. I, I'm going to make this one a little longer um, yep. and then um, make sure that it has a few weeks of time during it. And then I'm going to say this class meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and it has no, no holidays where it doesn't meet. Um, and once I've done that, um, then it will, um, then it won't behave uh, like you saw. So what was happening um, for you when you don't have any meeting dates is that the timeline says, okay, all of this time while this um, course is happening, uh, they don't actually meet in person at all. And so like, that's a holiday week. And so um, um, we can't put anything there. But once you set the meeting days, then you can um, add multiple weeks and, and edit the, the content in any of them. Okay, so if I have a, a, a voluntary um, meeting that is not uh, mandatory, I can just set a, a fake uh, sort of Sunday or anything just to- That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and, 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 then, and then, you know, for example, if I um, make this one have no actual meetings in the first week, Mm -hmm. Then it shows that and, and pushes everything else uh, ah. for a week later. Great. And where did I uh, edit that? Where did I press? On the timeline, if you click Edit Project Dates. Okay. Thank you very much. Then You're I'm welcome. happy. Hi, I have some questions. Um, thank you so much for explaining the uh, about the dashboard. I, I wasn't familiar with it, so excuse my ignorance. And since I have um, a partnerships mind hat on, um, I'm thinking about external partners. So I have two basic questions. Number one, when you talk, we're talking about existing courses that I could look for in, in, through the dashboard. I could access existing courses. Um, so those existing courses are materials, course materials about editing our projects that are up there, correct? Um, an existing course would typically be something that's happening in real life where people are editing Wikipedia and the main purpose of the dashboard page is to track how much they've contributed, give kind of an overview of their impact on Wikipedia. So we can, for example, look at this year's Art Plus Feminism and look at an individual event. And so we see that this one in Armenia had 60 editors who made 37,000 edits. Um, and that's the main purpose of it. Um, is that, did that answer your question? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, basically this is for a, a edit thons and campaigns that have been going on and to track people's participation in the changes that happened, yeah? Um, that's, that's one of the main purposes, yes. Um, it also can be used um, as a way to like 
show people how to edit Wikipedia. And the main uh, sort of venue for that is the, the training section of it. So this is a set of training modules that both, some of it is geared towards program organizers, uh, towards the kind of meta Wikimedia community. Um, and it has, you know, things like uh, materials developed by Wikimedia Foundation on how to deal with online harassment or how to deal with in-person events, keeping people safe. Um, it also has some Wikipedia how-to material that is kind of um, more streamlined and curated than the, the kind of diversity of uh, help material available on Wikipedia. Um, and some of this, in fact, is, is um, you know, accessible uh, in, in more than one language. Let's see what I think. I think these are translated into French. I hope they are. No. Um, let's just check on meta, find a language. OK. Um, great. So we will choose Portuguese, and we'll see the, the Portuguese translations of, of this training content. Um, so this will, would happen automatically if your browser was set to Portuguese. Wow, that's amazing. And my other question is about the new courses. So when people, when you refer to new courses, you were referring to new online editing events? Or were you referring to, you know, I want to teach people about animals through Wikipedia, so that's it, you know? Um, I was referring to, yeah, new, um, like, outreach-focused events. So that includes education programs where, you know, you as a teacher or professor are having your students edit Wikipedia, then um, this is a platform that you can use to keep track of who all your students are and what they're doing and, like, day-to-day, week-to-week, check in on, on their, their contributions. You can use it also to organize edit-a-thons. Um, and in that case, it can be very useful to kind of not only keep track of the impact of your edit-a-thon, but also take care of some of the logistic work of making sure people can get access to Wikipedia accounts uh, during it and make sure that you have a good, smooth way to also make sure that you know what their usernames are, um, which can be more of a headache than you might expect if you're running a large edit-a-thon for the first time. Fabulous. And my final question is, let's say, um, you know, I'm doing a partnership with, you know, the Colombian government and schools and they want to use this. Who is the go-to person that could help me explain how this works to partners? Um, probably, I don't know. Um, I mean, in terms of how the dashboard works and what its capabilities are, um, I'm, I am a great person you can talk to. Um, in terms of what it's like to, to run um, some kind of a partnership like that and what uh, people might want out of it in terms of, of data and what they might want to know to set up an agreement, um, the, the leaders of, of this group can probably point you to um, the right people who have expertise in that area. I know that um, that uh, Liana has has some uh, a little bit of knowledge about that. Fabulous! Thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah, I would also say if you um, Sage, if you want to show off the um, the campaigns homepage of where you can just scroll through all of the campaigns, you can kind of take a look at see who has. Um, who has run campaigns similar to what or programs similar to what you um, are looking to do in the past and then um, reach out to those folks. You'll be able to see their Wikimedia usernames um, on the dashboard. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, so if, that, if, you go, if you go to find programs um, on, on the dashboard, um, that'll show you both a list of, of the most active campaigns as well as um, if you scroll down far enough, there are a lot of active campaigns. Uh, also the most active individual um, programs that have happened. Um, and for example, the, the Wikidon um, program um, in, in Italy um, has, has run a whole bunch of events and you can see um, it's a mix of in-person things um, at, at, you know, um, like cultural institutions as well as 
online uh, events. Um, and you can kind of browse and, and just by the titles get a sense of the variety of different things that people have been up to. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Can I place a question, please? Yes. yes. I'm still trying to get the big picture on the training modules. I was trying to follow now. I'm still not very clear on it. So is this something we can incorporate into? So we like we run a campaign, we have some program there and we run different training sessions, let's say. So I can incorporate, incorporate the training module in it to give people like orientation in the basics and so on or because as far as it's now in english we don't really use it so much on national level but maybe it would be worth to translate it but i i'm still not familiar how how that actually really works sure so if you have an individual program um that's one way to use the training modules where you can include that training module as part of a timeline and then basically so it would be like an assignment. So people have like different things to do and then one of the assignments would be to go through the module. That's right. Um, okay. Or the other way that you can use the training module is just to send people directly to them. They don't require- Just to go through them. Okay. That's right. You can just link to, for example, the Wikipedia Essentials, which is designed to be like, okay, this is someone who's interested in broad strokes, knows what Wikipedia is, but they don't actually know anything about the culture of Wikipedia, the kind of how to think about editing Wikipedia, or like what the requirements are for, you know, writing things that are allowed to stick around. Um, so it's like so passive e-learning style, let's say, like. Um, so it's, it's a combination. Um, much of it is uh, just just text, but then it also has some some quizzes. So uh, to sort of knowledge check style, uh, where where you you know, make them find the right answer and explain, um, give an explanation of why the incorrect answers are wrong before they can continue along through the, the, the training modules. Um, but yeah, that's the, the gist of it. It's kind of um, slide-based uh, training modules. And if you, if we go into translation of this, mm -hmm. how is this done and can we modify it the slides or the parts? Great question. Um, so the way that it works is um, all of these slide, all of these training modules are configured uh, based on pages on Meta. Um, so the slide that I was just on, this, this quiz question, for example, um, if you click wiki source, um, it'll take you to the Meta page. Uh, and this uses the page translation interface. And so if I wanted to add a new language um, to this slide that isn't already translated to, then I could use um, you know, the, the existing meta page translation. And I'm not logged in right now and can't um, uh, actually like demo it, but you can see the, the translations that people have added um, on meta for this. So if you do go through and like slide by slide, add new translations um, to one of these modules, then uh, once you've done that, if you go to the, the main index page for that training module, um, there's a little link here that says reload from source, and that will prompt the dashboard to look for fresh translations um, of all of the content in this training module. Um, the, there's also view module source, which will take you to the page on Meta that basically defines which slides are part of this module. So it's also possible to write your own new module by um, creating a page like this on Meta um, that basically spells out, okay, these are all of the different pages to look to um, that make up this training module. Um, so that's, for example, what Wikimedia Germany has done um, with a set of, uh, let's see, uh, Wikipedia basis distance. Um, so th this is, these are Wikipedia basics training modules um, that were designed specifically for the things that uh, Wikimedia Germany wanted to try out with new users. And they've actually um, incorporated this into some of their experiments with inviting new users via banners and things like that. So they'll run banner campaigns 
um, to recruit new users and as part of what they show new users, uh, point them to the training modules. And so one of the things that we do is keep track of if you're signed in on the dashboard, which training modules you've completed. And so that's data that Wikimedia Germany has been using to try to figure out, okay, what are, what are effective ways to introduce people? What new materials can we give them that will actually make them stick around, things like that. Um, so if you're interested in writing a whole new training module of yet. <laughs> whatever you want, uh, it's possible uh, with an Upwork. Okay, thanks. Finally became clearer. Good. A follow-up question on that? Yes. Uh, I've seen there are pictures and some videos. Uh, could you add other sort of interactive things or is it those two that uh, are more visual? Um, there are quiz questions and um, images and yeah, videos from commons. Um, those are the main things that, that you can do. Um, if there are other types of interactivity that you're interested in, um, that's um, good things for me to know about. Um, I'm, we don't have specific plans around that right now, but I always like to know what people would like to do with these types of things if they could. Yeah, I was just thinking in the lines of um, other kinds of e-learning that I've come across, sort of dra drag and drop or uh, yeah, things like that. So, so one of the things that we do with the set of training modules um, that Wiki Education uses, um, which is um, similar to these Wikipedia training modules, um, with just some slight tweaks for, for customization for our programs. Um, one of the things that we do is have links in the middle of those training modules uh, that basically launch a guided tour on Wikipedia. So if you're familiar with the guided tours feature, um, that's something yeah. where you can code an interactive experience on the wiki. Um, so tossing people over there and then having them continue on with the training module um, has mm -hmm. worked pretty well for us. That takes a lot of work to develop those guided tours, but um, it can be pretty effective. Oh yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions for either Sage or Magnus? My question to both of you, I think, would be, do you have any new features planned that might be interesting to us? Ah, well, uh, <laughs> Uh, always new features planned, but uh, uh, time is short. Uh, so uh, I think PetSkin is working reasonably well for now. I'll um, uh, have to put my focus on uh, development somewhere else for a moment. But uh, I'm sure I'll come back to that and add some feature requests there. I'd be happy uh, to see that. <laughs> yeah, Sage? For the dashboard, um... There are no big sort of headline features um, that we're that we have planned right now that are that are super relevant for programs and events dashboard. Um, but we do have two um, ongoing projects right now: uh, Google Summer of Code projects uh, that are both focused on sort of um, the the stability and and uh, like finding errors and making sure that things are working um, as you expect and, and performance. So we have one, uh, one person who's working on basically um, reducing the amount of, of JavaScript code that you have to download so that the page loads much faster for people on, on uh, slow connections. Um, and then the other project is basically built around making it easier to see um, how often your program is being updated and whether any problems came up during the update process. So as, as Magnus was alluding to, um, with uh, like overloading uh, PET scan sometimes, depending on what uses it gets put to, um, the same is certainly possible uh, with programs and events dashboard. And we've in the past run into problems, for example, where people are tracking a group of users um, who are doing literally millions of edits on um, on Wikidata. Um, and that can um, like 
overwhelm the capacity of the dashboard to import all that data and, and keep track of it. Um, and in general, like working with extremely active users who make just thousands of edits or uh, you know tens of thousands of edits um, can run the risk of like us not being able to to pull in the data every time. And so we're working on making it more obvious when something went wrong, uh, so that you can kind of dig down and figure out exactly what the bottleneck was and if it was an actual error on the dashboard side of things because it got overwhelmed, then it'll make it easier for people to know when that happened and report it to me so that I can figure out uh, how to work around that problem. So in short, trying to make it more, uh, more resilient, more able to handle the kind of diversity of uses that people are putting it to, but no, uh, no user facing features specifically in the plans. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Any closing remarks or final questions? Thank you both. This is really helpful. Yes, thanks for me as well. <laughs> well, I guess then this is it. Thank you everyone for joining today, for participating in, in this um, great uh, showcase of great tools that we've built. Uh, well, <laughs> mostly the, the guys here that presented have built them, but basically, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great to, to see how they work. And, um, and it's great that we had so many questions about the, the inner workings of that, of those tools. So. Thanks everyone again, and we'll see you in about two months for our next um, online public meeting for the user group. And in the meantime, if you have any questions to the user group for us, you can always reach us on uh, one of the email uh, mailing lists or are directly to us. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. So I'd like to thank you all on, on behalf of the user group and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Philip, Magnus, and Sage. Thanks, everyone. And we can stop recording now. <laughs>